sometimes you and I hide behind some things that really aren't us. Sometimes you and I hide behind some fake ID badges, but they're really not true. It's not really true about us. And the Apostle Paul wants to come along and he wants us to underscore the fact that the truest thing about you, the truest thing about those of us who are in Christ is that we're in Christ. You are loved by Jesus and you are in Christ. It's identity. And identity is so important. In fact, one of the reasons why it's so important, we've already said in this series, identity determines behavior. And when you really understand who you are in Christ, it sets the stage for the rest of your life. Think about it. We've already said to you that the Apostle John sees himself as, hey, I'm just the one that Jesus loves. John's, that's how John saw himself. That's how he writes about himself. Hey, I'm just the one Jesus loves. That set the stage for John to live out the rest of his life. The Apostle Paul saw himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus. That's how he saw himself. I'm just a servant of the Lord Jesus. And that set the stage for the rest of his life. Now, those are two pretty good examples for you and I. Here's what we're going to do today. The Apostle Paul wants to give us two pictures. And he's going to hope that these two pictures are going to clinch our understanding of identity. And to, for us to understand who we really are in Christ. Two pictures. The first picture comes from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. Look at this. For he chose us in him. Before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, verse 5, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. It was his pleasure. He wanted to. He wanted to do this. And here's the picture. Adoption. The truest thing about you in Christ is that you are adopted by God. The truest thing about you in Christ, you've been adopted by God. Now that is such a huge message. And that was such a huge message for these Gentile Christians in Ephesus. Because the Judaizers were going around saying to these Gentile Christians, because they weren't Jewish first, they were illegitimate children. And the Apostle Paul jumps in and said, huh, no. Oh, no. You are chosen and you are adopted by God. That was huge. I understand that in Roman culture, especially there in Ephesus, that when a baby was born. Now, now kids, this is, this is not a great practice, but this is what was happening. When a baby was born, the baby, as soon as it was born, it would be wrapped up and it would be brought and it would be sat at the father's feet. If the father reached down and picked up the baby and embraced the baby, it signified acceptance and welcome and love and yes. But if the baby was placed at the father's feet and the father turned and walked away, It signified rejection and the baby was abandoned. Oh. Now the baby wasn't killed. It was abandoned by his dad. And, and, and the thinking was, you know, they weren't killed. They were just left to the elements. And the thinking was the gods would determine the fate of the children. So there in Ephesus, when that would happen, you know, m maybe the dad was wanting a boy and got a girl, or, or maybe he wanted a girl and got a boy, or maybe the baby was deformed, or, or maybe there were signs of some extreme weakness or sickness. The dad would turn and walk away, and then that baby would be taken to the Agora, the marketplace in e Ephesus. And people might come along and take the 
take the baby for themselves. Oh, no, not to adopt them. To raise them as slaves. Now, some of you in the audience today, if you were, if you were honest, and you, and you opened up to be a little bit of vulnerable about the message today, you would have to say that that word abandon has made up a huge part of your identity. And, and maybe for some of you, it, your dad abandoned you. And it's left you to look through that lens for the rest of your life. Maybe some of you were abandoned by a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse, and, and that is just that has affected every other relationship that you have, and there's no real trust there. You've been abandoned. Maybe you were abandoned by a friend who said they would be there. And maybe some of you feel like you were abandoned by a child. They, you gave them everything. Some of you might feel like you were abandoned by a company that you gave your whole life to. Some of you may even feel like you've been abandoned by a church that, that when you needed them the most. And some of you might even go to the point of you feel like God's abandoned you. The Apostle Paul comes on the scene. No, no, no. no. He didn't abandon you. He picked you up. And adopted you. I, I, this, this week I was reminded. In reference to Roman adoption. Which would have been what they were thinking about. Uh, there were a couple things true about Roman adoption. First, an adopted child would have equal rights as a natural born child. In fact, they were called co-heirs. There was no difference. That's pretty cool. I thought it was really cool in Roman adoption that when a person was adopted, the adopted person's past was totally erased. The past was totally erased. Even their financial debt totally canceled. They were given a brand new life. How many of you would love to be adopted today on the spot? <laughs> Woo! Right? To, to, to a brand new life totally erased. Right? And then I, what I thought was interesting in Roman adoption, the Romans rarely, if ever, adopted babies. Only adults were adopted. What? Only adults were adopted. And they were adopted by wealthy people who... They had a big business, or they had a lot of property, or they had a lot of money, and their kids were brats, and I don't want to go into them. But I know who I want to have it. And they would personally choose the one they wanted to have. And they would adopt an adult and give it all to them. Do you see the illustration? According to his pleasure and will. This is what God wanted. God wanted. He chose you. He wanted you. He wanted to give it all to you. And he chose you and adopted you. And the truest thing about you is you're adopted by almighty God. Ladies, you're a daughter of the king. Guys, you're adopted by Almighty God. That's picture number one. Picture number two. Uh, picture number one comes from Ephesians chapter one. You're adopted. Picture number two comes from Ephesians chapter two and verse 10. This is really cool. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now notice I put a little emphasis on handiwork. The word is masterpiece. The truest thing about you in Christ is that you are his masterpiece. You are his handiwork. Some translations say his workmanship. You could also translate it beautiful tapestry. I like that. Beautiful tapestry. Tapestry. Now the idea behind that is you have all these strands of your life and you know they don't even make sense. And when you look at the strands of your life, you're thinking, oh, what a mess. And God says, hey, in Christ, hey, give me those strands. Give me that. Watch what I can do. And he creates something beautiful. 
you're, you're his masterpiece. Now I want you to know, it has nothing to do with your failures. It has nothing to do with your successes. It has everything to do with who he is. And he takes the strands of your life and he makes you into something beautiful. You're his handiwork. You're his masterpiece. You're a, his beautiful tapestry. And if you need to break it down even more Sussex County, you are a piece of work. <laughs> Randy, am I right? You are a piece of work. You are his piece of work. And it has nothing to do with what you've done or what you've accomplished or what you didn't do. It has everything to do with who he is. You're adopted. You're his masterpiece. Some of you need to hear that again today. You need to hear it. Cliff, you're his masterpiece. Jim, you're, you're his handiwork. Andy, you're a piece of work. I mean, you're a, his piece of work. Oh. Jerry, you're, you're his masterpiece. Yes, we are. Tom, you're a piece of work. You're his piece of work, right? You, you, the truest thing about us today, the truest thing, you, we've been adopted by God and we're his masterpiece. A beautiful tapestry. My mother-in-law is going to be here the second service and I can't wait to say, you, you, <laughs> hey, the coffee's free today, is it not? I might need a little more caffeine going into the next service. Wow. Hey, now listen. If only we could get those two pictures. Oh, if only we could get it. Because here's what the deal is. Remember a couple weeks ago, I remind you that the pattern of the world is for us to focus on our image. The pattern of this world is for us to be so consumed with our image. Oh, we're, we're way too consumed with our image. And because of that, you and I, way too often, we're so, we're so worried about what others do and what others say and what others think about us. And that becomes our identity. Too many of us are worried about what others think about us. And that tends to become our identity. Don't give other people that kind of power in your life. Amen? Listen to what God says about you. Some of you, some of you today need to go home and, and uh, you know, pull a Jesse Rice. Jesse Rice wrote an article that she entitled, An Open Letter to My Fear of What Others Think. I got to read this to you. Dear fear of what others think. I am sick of you and it's time we break up. I know we've broken up and gotten back together about a bazillion times. But seriously, fear of what others think, this is it, we're done, we're breaking up. Because I'm tired of overthinking my status updates on Facebook. Trying to sound more clever and funny and important. I'm sick of being anxious about what I say or do in public, especially around people I don't know. All in hopes that they'll like me, accept me, and praise me. I run around all day long feeling like a golden retriever, desiring nothing more than for you to like me, like me, like me. I'm so tired of feeling bad about myself all the time. Bad about how I look. Bad about my job. Bad about my net worth. Because of what others think. I go through my day with a cloud of shame hanging over my head. I never stop acting. The spotlight's always on and I'm center stage. And I better keep dancing and posturing or else the spotlight will move. And I'm sure I'll dissolve into a little meaningless puddle on the ground. Just like that witch in The Wizard of Oz. I can never live up to the expectations. My imaginary audience, the one that lives only in my head, but whose collective voice is louder than any voice in the universe. 
And all this is especially horrible, terrible, evil. Because if I really stop and think about it and let things go quiet and listen patiently for the voice of God who made me, who died for me, who delights in me, it turns out I'm actually profoundly precious, lovable, worthy, valuable, and, and even just a little ghetto fabulous. She writes, So when I find my identity in Christ, then you, fear of what others think, turn back into a tiny, whiny, yappy, little wiener dog that you are. <laughs> so eat it, fear of what others think. You and I are done. And no, I'm not interested in talking this through. I'm running and jumping and laughing you out of my life once for all. At least that's what I really, really want. Please help me, God. Really, the only way to break the lens of those fake ID badges you've been hiding behind is to just in quiet start listening to what the Heavenly Father says about you. And the truest thing about you has nothing to do with your failures, has nothing to do with your successes, has everything to do with what God has done for you. And He, friends, has adopted you. He picked you up and welcomed you in and adopted you and he calls you his masterpiece. I'm going to close out this series with a special prayer for all of you. What I want more than anything for all of you is this prayer. It's the same prayer the Apostle Paul had for the church in Ephesus that he loved. Look at this verse. I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When you know His love, you know who you are. When you know His love, you can be complete. When you get his love, you can be fulfilled. When you understand his love for you, you can understand who you really are. And so one more time, hear me say, the truest thing about you is that Jesus loves you. Charles Cooley, Dean of American Sociology, said, gives us this quote. Your self-concept, now that's identity language. Your self-concept comes from what you think the most important person in your life thinks of you. He's saying your identity comes from what you think the most important person in your life thinks of you. So here's the huge question to conclude this series. Who is that? <laughs> At least the front row gets it. Who is that? I pray it's Jesus.